Hey, hello! This is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration to help us in the process of getting students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I work at IE Business School Publishing, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. So hello, Engagers. Today, you might want to listen in because we have John Meehan. John, did I, did I get that last name right? You know, I don't know how to pronounce my own last name. So yeah, <laughs> let's go with, with something like that. Meehan, Meehan, I've heard it a bunch of different ways. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. So John, are you prepared to engage? Uh, yeah, I, I if I can figure out how to do my last name today and engage in this, this will be fantastic. So I'm all in. <laughs> Beautiful. So John here today, he is a high school English teacher at, and the school instructional coach at the Bishop O'Connell High School in Arlington, Virginia. He is a member of the 2016-2018 uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's Teacher Advisory Council. Uh, he's also a member of the ASCD Emerging Leaders Class of 2017 and a 2016 40 Under 40 honoree in the Arlington Leadership Center for Excellence. He's also a multi-time presenter at annual conferences for the Virginia ASCD, the National Catholic Education Association, and the Play Like a Champion Today conference at the University of Notre Dame. He's a champion for high energy, student-centered instru instruction, and his professional Twitter feed, Mihan, or Mian, however you want to pronounce it, edu, <laughs> is also packed with a daily array of photos, videos, blogs, tweets, and podcasts of he and his students putting this same spirit into action. His fully gamified high school English class website is likewise loaded with all sorts of ideas for classrooms, games, side quests, leaderboards, and world building storylines. So, John, that sounds very, very exciting. And first off, uh, we already talked about your Twitter feed, which is M E E H A N E D U. Um, yes, that's the Twitter feed. Is there anywhere else you would like for us to find you? I, the, the website will be will be in the show notes. Yeah, perfect. I mean, the web website is in the show notes. It's great. It's uh, it's uh, sort of my classroom uh, stuff is all there, and like my Twitter feed is pretty much. I told my principal it's it's my CV online. Like my my CV is I print out my Twitter feed and I just like put a link to my bio, and I'm like, if you just want to take a look, it's what I'm reading, it's what I'm up to, it's what I'm learning. Um, it's I mean, like I'll, I'll take part of this conversation. And I'll put all that great stuff back up there. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Fantastic. So, John, the first question that we always like to, to get into, and it's to get to know you guys a little bit better, is what does a day with John Meehan look like? Uh, that's a good question. So I think every single person you've had on the show has said, you know, there's not really a typical day. Um, <laughs> I think there's <laughs> Probably a Probably every because, single one, yeah. Right, right, because we're, we're all game changers, right? So we're here to, to mix it up a little, a little bit. And I think we, we maybe either get bored easily or we just love exploring. Um, but my, my days are, are, are pretty, pretty fixed in their structure. Um, so maybe I'm an, I'm an exception that proves the rule. Um, but uh, I'm an instructional coach at a Bishop O'Connell High School in Arlington, Virginia. Um, so we live in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Beltway traffic is pretty terrible. Um, and that <laughs> means uh, if I work for 8 to 10 hours a day uh, at school, I probably spend another 8 to 10 hours a week in the car. Um, so I get an extra bonus day um, in my vehicle, which is not great. Um, but that's the cost of doing business when you live in the nation's capital. Um, so when I'm headed into work, and I'll usually head in, you know, just before six, um, and uh, you know, get a thirty to forty minute car ride, depending if traffic's good on the way in, and maybe an hour and change on the way back. Um, I use that time to to listen to podcasts about education. Um, Professor Game is like heavy rotation in there with a bunch of other ones, um, <laughs> and just I fill up my tanks uh, because I know when I get to work, it's going to be like a all out kind of day. Um, so I'll use my mornings to listen to podcasts or listen to books on tape about teaching. Um, and then when I come home, I'll, I'll usually use that afternoon time in the car, um, to listen to, uh, audio tapes or, or Voxer chats about things that I'm teaching. So like I use the morning to fill up my brain on instructional coaching and then the afternoon to kind of do the debrief on the, the teaching side of things. Cause my, my job has two hemispheres. Um, what I do teach being uh, that, um, uh, what's the name? In instructional coach at, at the Bishop O'Connell high school mean. Okay. So that's a great Good question. Um, uh, instructional coaching is is not a new field per se, but it's newer in professional development. Um, there's a great bit of research out from the University of Kansas has a great coaching project um, under the direction of Dr. Jim Knight, um, and he's he's brilliant. Um, and he's published a bunch of books about traditional PD and uh, how awful it is. Um, like all, <laughs> all the research suggests that like that one size fits all ends up fitting nobody. Um, and something like 
I think there's a 5% yield or implementation efficacy um, over time with a traditional PD. It's like everyone comes in, we get talked at, here's the new pedagogy, I want you all to apply it in your classrooms. And only about 5% ever really makes it way into the classroom. So um, professional development through instructional coaching is job embedded, um, strictly observational, non-evaluative through a uh, partnership approach. And that's my, my, my stump speech uh, version of how I sell it to family. I'm really cool at Thanksgiving when they ask me what I do. Um, that, that's, <laughs> I, it's like personal training for teachers. Um, so it's job embedded where teachers drop by and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm having trouble with classroom management or I, I need tech tools to get the students um, you know, int integrated more fully into the, the curriculum. Or maybe they need help uh, with, with different instructional strategies or you know, the idea of co-lesson planning or collaborating. So Equivalent, uh, the equivalent I could say is if you're training for a marathon, it's a different workout regimen than if you're trying to be a power lifter. And a good coach can kind of help you set goals for yourself and then move you from your point A to your point B. And that's kind of what I do all day. So I'm like human Google a little bit. Um, I work with a full-time <laughs> faculty of... It, it, it sounds like you're, you're the guy that when they have some sort of problem and they're looking into something, yeah. they go to you, no matter if it's your expertise directly or it's something else. And... I, I, I pull a lot of cats out of trees, man. It's, it's kind of crazy. Like it just this, everything that you think about, it's like a resetting a projector or, you know, helping somebody, <laughs> you know, turn on their computer. And it's, it's, it's small and it's, it's, but other times there's like this whole person piece of it. Teachers need support as, as educators. They need to be listened to. They need to have like a place to vent and a place to feel safe. And so everything that we work on is strictly confidential, which is awesome. So they really can just open their brains and kind of spill their guts and um, be vulnerable and say, hey, here's what I'm working through and here's what I'm working on. And the implementation of success is, is really, really good. Um, the, the research suggests on a national level, it's about 85% um, of teachers who take part in instructional coaching on a deep one-on-one -on -one level uh, tend to say that it's highly valuable. Um, and that, that's like an 80% better than the traditional model. Um, so it keeps me employed, it keeps me really busy because there's always work to be done, you know? Uh, I, I, yeah, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a crazy piece of, so that's what I'm doing when I'm not teaching my class. And I guess I spend the other time in the class uh, with the kids and that's, that's awesome too because then I'm, I'm living what I'm saying I'm doing. So I'm not just that guy who says, oh, here's how you do it from the top of the ivory tower, but we're really right there in the trenches and, and saying, here, come see it in my class. Cool. Cool, and that sounds very exciting as well. To and puts you in a position to, to be able to help many people implement exciting stuff for sure. Yeah, man, exactly right, exactly right. So, John, let's get dive right into the first like um, formal question, so to speak. And we would like for you to tell us a, a story. We're all into story, especially in this, this first section, and it's a story of what we like to call, you know, your favorite fail or your favorite failure when when using gamification and especially since you're a teacher in the classroom or in the school. And of course, we all, always learn from failure as well as, as as in games. So what did you learn from that experience is the next natural question. So Rob, I've been preparing for this question like all week because I've listened to the podcast back. <laughs> I need you to, 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 to like be my, my backup here because I think I think this sounded like a great idea. So I'll, I'll spell it out that way. There's my story. I think it sounds like a great idea. And I'll check in with you like to make sure that, that I'm not crazy. Um, so my students uh, in my American Lit class, uh, it's high school juniors, uh, so 11th grade students. And they were writing long form research papers, eight to 10 pages um, with primary source integration and like secondary source, um, like critical analyses kind of incorporated throughout. Um, that sounds really boring, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a, as a place to start, it's not the most uh, attractive curb appeal type of thing to make a game out of. Um, and and I didn't like that this part of the year becomes like sort of an academic death march. Um, so I, I try to add this idea of choice in that students could pick their own novels to, to read and then like do the critical research. So they're picking their novels, they're picking their secondary source criticism. Like already that's better than everyone has to write an essay on, you know, uh, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. Not that Huckleberry is not a great book, but that's 40 essays that you're going to have a hard time just kind of your brain sort of belts down after a time. Um, you with me so far? Like so far that makes sense, right? <laughs> Looks like it. Okay. All right. Well, this is where it gets bad. Um, so I said, let's, let's have them all write outlines because outlines will help us kind of make sense of it. Um, and then they'll come into class and I went and bought a bunch of role playing game dice. Um, so like, you know, the D4, the D20, the D12s. And I was like, so here's the deal. I'll break them up into, I'll call them battle stations. And they'll review their outlines with their peers to see where their outlines are strong and weak. Um, so that the different battle stations would be like where they would roll the dice. And each of the battle stations would, 
be worth a different point value. So like there's the five point station, the four point, the three point, the two. And then you self-select for yourself, hey, where do you feel comfortable going? You go to a battle station and battle up against other people who feel that same level of comfort or confidence. And again, it's, it's not a graded exercise, it's, it's a review exercise. Um, I thought that that made a lot of sense. Like in my head, that was a great way to sort of take the sting out of a very hard project. Um, with the vision being that they would then spend, I don't know, 10 minutes at each station, reviewing with one another, hey, I think you did well with this, I think I did better with that, okay, fine. And then at the conclusion of that 10 minute time uh, piece to review their work products, they would then take their dice and vote amongst themselves who had the strongest work product and then assign the dice uh, choice based on who had the stronger work product. So if, if Robin, you and I are at the same state station, uh, yours is better than mine, so you have a choice. Do you want the D20, the D6, or the D4? Like, of course you're gonna pick the D20. Um, and then the next student in the sequence would then pick the second dice and so on and so forth. And then they roll off and score the number of points based on uh, the success of the roll. So really all you're getting is a slight advantage if you have a stronger piece. But really you spent 10 to 15 minutes reviewing the work product and uh, I thought that made so much sense. And like, it did not go well <laughs> at all. <laughs> it was a, a massive failure. Um, but before I guess I talk about what I learned about it, like, does that, I mean that layout sounds like it should have, or it could have worked, right? Yeah, but the, the, well, I'm not gonna get into details. I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna pull out some learnings that I'm already getting from That's what, you, no. from what yeah, you had. Okay. But yep. what was like uh, that? What did it fail? Like as specific as you can. You don't you don't have to give every single detail. But what is it that went wrong? I have my suspicions. But oh man, gosh. <laughs> well, uh, like I mean, I know it's only like a 30 minute podcast, but oh, everything went wrong. So first of all, dice are cool, like awesome. And if you have that tactile thing of just being able to hold the dice, some of these kids have never seen a D20. Um, like that's just a fun thing to have in your hand. So that turned into a problem real quick. And I'm, I'm really good at classroom management. Like I'm, I'm not having kids like throwing them around the class, but they just, they're fun to play with, you know? Um, so that was a problem. Second problem was the kids all read novels different from one another. So as they're reading one another's work, they're just like learning the content for the first time. Like, Hey, I read Fahrenheit 451. There's a character called Guy Montag. Nobody's looking for like the nuance of the, the sentence construction if they're just learning new information. So I think they're, I overloaded the schema theory way too early. And then on top of that, there's this battle element and that they're at a certain point, like they know they're, they're dead in the water with maybe they didn't read the book so carefully or don't have great research. So they show up at the new battle station and they're like, oh, yeah, mine's awful. Don't even bother reading it. Let's just roll the dice. <laughs> and so they just race to like the fun stuff. And like they're spending four seconds at an activity that was designed to be 15 minutes. And even though I'm trying to like play referee, I have like 20 or 30 kids in a class who are, are a different... It, it's like when you give people cotton candy for dinner and then you're like, no, 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 let's go back to the meat and potatoes. That, it was over. It was over before it started. <laughs> I, uh, I, I had a lot of things I presupposed and I think I was so enamored of the idea that I had a game that I, I didn't stop and think about like what I needed them to feel and what, and that should have dictated what I needed them to do. Um, <laughs> so that, that was, that was my next question. What was your, 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 I mean, of course, what, what did you learn from that initially? What do you, do you feel could be something that you would have done differently or approached maybe differently after you saw that? I think it's okay sometimes to have things that are not fun. Um, and I think that simply saying this is going to be fun, uh, is, is, I mean, the phrase that you, you throw around a lot, and it's true, it's like chocolate covered broccoli, right? Like, broccoli is broccoli, man. Like, at a certain point, you have to eat your veggies. And I think that what I learned is, if I try to just throw a cheap coat of paint on something, no matter how much time I put into that paint, like, as proud as I was of it, um, I thought it would be so much fun to roll dice and compare. What I, what I failed to recognize is, like, the students had trouble even being proud of what they had written, and so to be vulnerable, uh, they were not gonna feel comfortable with that. And when they're in a defense mode, like fight or flight, it's much easier to make jokes out of things than it is to like dig in and do some real serious um, self-reflection. And that's on me. Um, like that's on me and my instructional design that time. It was it was a noble failure, um, but it was it taught me a lot about how I had to approach future game mechanics. Um, and like we all did a really good debrief on that activity and why it failed. Which so nothing was wasted, but it. it it wasn't the lesson I thought I would learn from it. I guess if that makes any sense. <laughs> so I, I there, there's many things I, I, I was when I was listening that were coming up in, in, into my head. So the first thing was what was your objective? I mean, what what were you thinking? Of, was your objective when you said well, I'm gonna roll some dice and I'm gonna do the battle? What were you trying to get from the students when you did that? 
I think what I was trying to elicit was the idea of a self-scaffolding activity. Um, like, if you don't feel comfortable going to a level five, then only go to level two or level three. And like, it felt like to me like Pokemon, right? Like, yeah. hey, if you're not leveled up yet to to go battle the big guys and like battle the little Charmanders or the Pikachu's, okay, fine. And like that, that's that's great. Um, that, that 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 part I I I, I like got it like firsthand. What I kind of got confused at was when you started doing the the battle with the dice and those things like. After they compared and they did all those things, what was your thinking when you when you created the the battle with the dice and those and those, those parts? Yeah, I think the answer is like I just got so caught up in this idea of well, they're going to show up at different stations, self scaffold. There's a strength and weaknesses, but like, is there any fun or joy in just comparing? I was like, what's the, what's the takeaway? How do you how do you deliver that 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 <laughs> that big piece? Because otherwise, it's just like okay, if you think you're good, then go. The kids are good, and so I wanted them to have a chance to to say, hey, look, I'm not great at this, but you know what, I am great at that. And so like, you know, each each round of the battles would be like, okay, let's for just grammar mistakes this time, or you know, just sentence construction. Um, but it just got it got away from me. And uh, you know, like when you fall fall behind early in a football game, then it's like you, you it takes away about half of your arsenal. So you're just trying to play catch up the whole time. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So the, the the two learnings for me was for when I was listening to you was was to establish like very clearly what you want to obtain when you when you gamify something. What? Yes. Why are you gamifying it? What's the objective that you're trying to get? What's going to be different, and why you want to make it different? Because perhaps there's things that that were that were great, but you have to think. I mean, before adding and and, and jumping into mechanics and to fun things, um, which is great uh, for me. One of the things that I could learn from that was was thinking about what you wanted to achieve, and the other one is um and this comes up very very frequently so nobody has to feel anything about it but it's the thing of thinking of your players and there's many levels to that in your case i guess you you, you didn't think how they would be reacting to what you were doing but that's fine that was your experimentation phase as well you were testing it for the first time i mean that that's not nothing wrong with that it was like live ammunition like oops you know i <laughs> I, i shouldn't have done that uh but like i said it It was a really valuable, and in fairness to me, like it was very early in when I had gamified uh, yes. the classroom. So it was like yes. one of the first games I had built. No, um, I'm, I'm sure like, you've, you've grown a lot from that. Um, but I just I wanted so. to highlight that because it's something that I think at some point, uh, at some level, we have all gone, gone through, like forgetting about the, the users and yep. forgetting about the players and the learners and going straight into something that excites us very much. This is what Monica Cornetti calls self-hugging, what Pete Jenkins was talking in one of the recent interviews and saying that he got so excited about the game, he for, completely forgot about the client. And the client got mad because he said, you know, you lost all this time doing all these games and, and all this stuff, and it's not what we were looking for. So that's yeah, something that happens yeah. to everybody. So my, my highlight here is, yes, those are some learnings. Those are some things that you might want to try to escape from when you're designing for the first or the first few times. But it's something that will happen. I mean, this or in another form, it will happen. And it's fine. Yeah. I mean, you can see now, John, he's very excited. He's very happy about gamification and doing it in many different ways. And that's that's where we want to shift onto right now. It's something that you've faced and, and you said, well, this is something that is a very, maybe a tough subject, something I've been looking forward to changing. And you said, well, I'm going to apply gamification to this. And it was a complete success for whatever reason, maybe not in the first round, maybe not in the second. But when did it turn into a success like tell us that story what happened and how you how you got to that conclusion yeah um it's, it's nicer to tell this one than the other one right <laughs> um the uh i i went to a, a uh i guess at ed camp uh, maybe last year and i i was introduced to breakout edu and i love the class escape room idea it's awesome like if you've not used breakout it's an awesome product uh, they are fantastic um, really good people it's it's former educators who decided to like come up with like they sell you a kit with a bunch of physical locks um that you can reset And then there's like a UV flashlight in there and like a red lens for like decoders. Um, and it's game-based puzzles that you can kind of write for yourself. I think when you when you buy their product, you get a year subscription to their database of a whole bunch of puzzles. Um, and I, I did the training in the morning and I was like so impressed. I hit like the mash that, like order this but like order this kit um, in the afternoon. I was all about it. So I put a rush order delivery on a Saturday afternoon. Like, okay, let's get this in my class by next week. And I think it, it took them like a, maybe only like four or five days to get it to me. But in the time since when I ordered it and the time like when they said, and now it's shipping, I built my own escape room. Like I was like, oh, I'm so in. <laughs> like I, I go all in real quick. Um, and, and maybe that's to a fault. Um, but the escape room was great. I mean, the kids love it. They, they, there's collaboration. There's teamwork. There's like problem solving. There's failing forward. It's grit. It's, 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 it's resiliency. And that was awesome. Um, but one of the things that I noticed with that the escape room activity is that It was great at the end of the unit. Um, it was it was less effective in the 
beginning of the pre-teaching of a unit because you wanted to make sure that every student had access to all of the information. And at the end of a unit, you can be reasonably sure that everybody's kind of had their servings. Um, in an escape room activity, maybe only three or four kids are working on one puzzle. And that maybe that puzzle takes them a half hour. Um, it's hard to sort of get that equity and that distribution that the gamified um, element there is able to provide. So I kind of hit the drawing board and I said, well, what can I do to like, instead of maybe breaking out of a unit, like use that same escape room in reverse, like uh, to break into a unit, like brand new content. Um, and so I, I went back to like the idea of like kindergarten, you might even laugh about it, but like old school like centers or like um, stations activities where like students rotate between different stations. And I cooked up a gamified twist on it, which I called um, the QR break-in. Um, the idea was it's like a, a team-based challenge that you and three or four friends are working together in a cluster team, completing a series of stations activities. Um, when you're done at station one, you move to two, and two to three, and three to four, and so on. But they're asynchronous. So each of these different stations is a different puzzle to like teach you part of the story that we're moving into. Um, and so like by way of example, if we're learning like The Great Gatsby, um, maybe they've just read just the first chapter of the story. I wanted to get a little bit of plot, a little bit of character, but I also wanted to get like a little bit of the history or the backstory of like uh, you know the, the jazz age or prohibition, or I wanted to learn a little bit about uh, like bootleggers, organized crime, and so there's a lot of things that are happening um, asynchronously. And so I, I I had this idea of a centers activity, and I was like, well, that's cool. Let's just make it like eight or ten centers with eight or ten activities, and each one has a work product or a deliverable. So maybe at center one, it's like watch this YouTube video and take some notes. Um, at center two, it could be uh, Here's a, a QR code, scan it and read this article about prohibition and write down five things that are of interest to you. Um, or like a Flipgrid station or an Ed Puzzle or um, you know, things like that. Um, and then I took this, this same methodology and I looked at like, the idea of The Great Gatsby is about you know, spending time with the really rich people in, in New York and exploring their mansions and learning about this culture. And I was like, well, using games from childhood that I really liked, um, I thought about the game of Clue, which is like, I don't know, you just sort of explore different rooms and you learn secrets and you piece together this puzzle. And like, that's the story of The Great Gatsby. It's trying to figure out who these people are while you kind of explore their world. And so the pedagogy then kind of came after that because I wanted my users to feel um, a sense of like awestruck wonder as they entered this, this brand new mansion. So I, I hammered out a quick game board on the overhead and each of the puzzles was a different room that they could kind of bounce between. Each of the puzzles as they solved it, then they got like a, another clue or a piece of a puzzle, which then ultimately was the big clue at the end. And the teams kind of competed with one another about... Um, the first team to comp complete all of the eight or set 10 centers was like the winner. Um, and like then they're working so hard um, and doing way more work that would probably have taken me about two weeks worth of lecture. And they're doing it in 80 minutes. And I was like, oh, this is this is money. Like this is going to work. Um, because then we hit our seminars like they're so in because they've done a timeline. They've done a sketch note. They've done a flip grid. They've done an ed puzzle. They've done a YouTube. And like each student is bringing something different to the, the sort of smorgasbord we're kind of enjoying together. Um, and that was really, really empowering. So we wound up using that same sort of pedagogy every time we broke into a new new unit. Um, it takes a lot of time to like draw up the visuals of it, but like it runs itself in the classroom. And then you can be like the dungeon master, like the kind of game guide, rather than the, you know, the director of, of the show. You kind of just sit back and kind of watch it, watch it play out. <laughs> Sounds very exciting. That that's very exciting. I've been. Um, um, this is probably the first time I'm going to say it live, but I'm I'm thinking of something similar uh, of an to an ex escape room for a class I'm going to have in fall. I'm going to try and plan it as far ahead in advance as I can. It's going to be probably something a surprise and like an additional activity, but it's something that I've been pondering recently, and I have to get into the details, of course. But that all those all that inspiration that you got is something that is certainly going to 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 inspire me as well. So thank you for that story, John. Oh no problem, man. Yeah, and like I said, I, I, I love it because then when they come to this seminar, they're so ready, like they're so in because they've they've all brought stuff. And if you've used um. It's called Equity Maps. It's an iPad app. Um, it, it's it's really really good. It's by a teacher named Dave Nelson, who's out of um, I think an international school in Greece, and it, it allows you to chart your seminar like a, a spider web discussion, and it gives like feedback analytics about like how much time each person talked and how many times each person talked, and then you can kind of track the like the the dashboard of like. The, it gives you like the equity quotient of how ev evenly you're sharing your conversation, how deep it's going. And then I can use that as a gamified element. Like, okay, guys, here's where we started. We started at 65% shared. Can we get to 82% shared? And again, the game is always giving more feedback. So they're learning and it's just self-reflective. And it's, it's, it's awesome, man. I mean, it, my job is, is so much fun now. <laughs> that sounds amazing. 
But I now want to get into something else, and it's something that we we love to to get from from you guys, and and, and we've been seeing recently that there's a, a lot of convergence around the process that people follow for for gamification. However, everybody has has an angle. Everybody has something perhaps slightly different. There are some people who have said that they take it from somebody else, and that's fine as well. But do you follow any sort of process when you are creating a, a, a gamification activity or a gamified classroom uh, when when you're preparing that? What is your process? Or if I came up to you, and I'm one of your teachers, and I say, well, I want to gamify my classroom. What, what should I do? What's, what's the process that I should do? Um, I think you hit it on the head uh, maybe 10 minutes ago. I was, I was kind of reviewing my notes beforehand. It's like the um, Yukai's book, um, I didn't know you had him, him on the show, Yukai Chow. Um, his book is, you know, actionable gamification. He talks about in there yes. um, that great game designers focus first on what they want the user to feel and then move to what they want the user to do. Um, and the, the poet E.E. E. Cummings uh, has that phrase, since feeling is first, who pays attention to the syntax of things? Like, the feeling needs to be the driver. Um, I had a, a game presentation in, in Ohio a few months back, and I had a teacher reach out to me afterwards about gamification. And she says, look, I'm teaching flowers for Algernon. I want to make a game out of it. You know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, what do you want the kids to feel? And she's like, well, I, I want him to feel empathy for this, this main character, uh, Charlie, who's, who's mentally disabled. And he undergoes this experimental treatment to become a super genius. Um, and he writes his journal, his diary about that. I was like, well, that's the story then. You want them to feel connected to somebody who feels like they don't fit in. You want them to feel um, like solidarity with somebody who just wants to find their voice. And that's the genesis of your game. Um, starting with that feeling, then, it's really easy to then spring from there to move through your theme. Um, I think the the feeling will will dictate the theme, and because I'm a humanities teacher, so much of the theme does come from the narratives of the stories that we're reading, whether it's like you know uh, ancient China or like the stories of you know the the Far East or you know a Gold Rush. I mean, whatever these settings are, different different stories sort of spring from that. So this, the the setting really springs um, into this idea of, of narrative, the power of story, and um, then once you have a narrative, it, kind of the world building kind of comes really as, as, a, as an upshot of that. I think if you, you guys' book is called like um, Actionable Gamification Beyond Points, Badges, and Leaderboards. Yes, yes, and that's a very important phrase. <laughs> I, 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 I would even challenge it. Maybe I, I would love to meet you, Kai, and, and, and say as much. Like, I think it's even the actionable gamification before points, badges, and leaderboards. Like, it's all of the thought that goes into it because the last thing you have to worry about is the rolling of dice and silly battles between teams. Like, <laughs> what do I want these kids to feel? Um, and and it, when you start that way, like you have the kids will be okay not playing a game like because they're they're in for the emotional heart of why this thing matters you know if you're playing the great gatsby game you want them to feel like you're just trying to fit in in a world that is like these people who won't ever accept you that's the story of their narrator and that's the story of the protagonist and like who hasn't felt that so being able to let them put themselves in the shoes of 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 those players and again as, as gamified classroom goes it's like well what do you want your students to to walk away from this class feeling and if you can sum it up in one word that that feeling is, is at the heart of it because that really grows out your narrative and then like I said your characters your arc your artifacts and your points and all that stuff kind of emerge from that center. But that's I think the beating heart behind it. Yeah, definitely. So start again with what you want the people to feel and then you will spring from that your theme, uh, the mechanics that you want to implement, whether that includes points, badges, and or leaderboards or not. Um, but start with what you want to achieve, what you want the students to feel, what you want them to learn. Um, what's your objective with using gamification? And there is well where most of the other things will, will, will come through. So thank you for that. 100% agree. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, John. Now we're going to move into the what we like to call the second part of the interview. And here we're, we're going beyond, uh, not points, badges, and leaderboards, but beyond the story. <laughs> we're, we're going for, for quick tips, tools, uh, quick answers in general. And the first thing that we would like to know is if, if you've, you've seen in, in your experience, and especially in the position you're in, um, that you're also coaching other, other teachers, is, is there something that you would feel that is like a, a best practice in gamification or, or something that you could feel that almost any classroom using gamification could benefit from? Um, I think this comes up a lot on this podcast too, but like the immersive power of storytelling and a, and a, and a cohesive theme. Um, like if my badge battle was about Pokemon, like the research paper wasn't about Pokemon. And at a certain point, if kids don't understand Pokemon, like that's a lot of new schema to introduce. Oh yeah, and by the way, we're rolling dice. And oh yeah, by the way, you're working on a paper. And oh yeah, you're working on a different paper and a different book. It's like, that's a lot, it's too much. Um, like the clarity of one 
story to drive your game. And it could be a one day event, but like, okay, guys, hey, we're, I have a, a teacher in my building. Um, she was teaching a unit on um, a, a, um, World War One, and she had the kids reenact a trench warfare in the classroom. They sent up their desks and they were like throwing paper at each other and they were hiding behind stuff. Like, that's an awesome day. And, and you didn't have to get too cute about it. Like, the day was a reenactment of that with like these different time centers in each one. Like, that's smart teaching. And like, any student can feel that theme and remember that for a long time forward. Um, so I think that that, that, that clarity of a, of a theme really lends to a story. Um, not the other way around. You can't just be like, oh, I have a story I want to tell, so let me pick a, a random um, you know, intellectual <laughs> property and just drop it on there. Random theme. <laughs> yeah. That's it. So, John, uh, the next question is a bit more random, and it's about which is your favorite game? Uh, um, I think to play as, uh, as, as a video game goes, I would say um, the original Legend of Zelda for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, and then I think uh, the, the Mario 64 for the Nintendo 64, because both of them are just that open world play, and like you learn through exploring, and you learn by just trying stuff, and it's totally asynchronous. Um, I think it, it's, it's super smart to... to as, as, as both of those games go, they're just those open world uh, concepts are, are really um, empowering. Yeah, um, those concepts uh, to, to apply them to education is, is extremely hard for sure. But yeah, yeah. The, w when you get to reach that kind of thing, it's, it can be absolutely beautiful. Uh, that's well said. Very well said. <laughs> so, John, is there anybody that you, you have, especially that you haven't heard in Professor Game, that you would like to listen to in, in an interview in Professor Game? Yeah, I think I, I, I come up with uh, three names off the top of my head. Um, Greg Tapo uh, is the senior editor of Inside Higher Ed. Um, he was formerly a, the national education correspondent for the um, USA Today. And he wrote a book called um, The Game Believes in You, How Digital Play Can Make Our Kids Smarter. Um, I had a chance to hear him speak at a, a few conferences ago. He's awesome. He's awesome. So if you have a chance to like pin him down, he's a smart guy. Uh, he knows his stuff. Um, I think uh, Michael Matera is another one. He wrote uh, Explore Like a Pirate. Yes, um, and he has a podcast. Have you listened to it? He does. I, 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 I've been on that podcast. Uh, Michael is, is brilliant. He's a great dude. I've had the pleasure of meeting him in real life, which is a, a rarity in so many of these education circles. I um, mean, he's just as cool in real life. Um, but he's, he's really involved with the XP Lap community on Twitter, um, and he gives back so much. Um, he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's a gamification guru, a great guy. Um, and then the other one I have um, is, uh, I have the book up on the shelf behind me, uh, Dr. Catherine McKnight. Um, she wrote, uh, she's, she's an educator and researcher just out of Chicago. Um, and she's published like a dozen or so books. But uh, the one that really stands out to me, which is like off the beaten path, but I think you'll love it. It's the Second City Guide to Improv in the Classroom. Um, and so it's the Second City Improv Troupe, like the idea of improv games and how we make improv happen, um, the idea of yes and. Um, and she she wrote a whole book about how improv works um, and how it can be directly applied to, to education stuff. Um, she's an awesome person. She's, she's a lot of fun, um, and she has a great focus on content literacy. Um, she's on Twitter. I think she tweets under the name at Literacy World, um, and she has a podcast as well. But like, she's an awesome um, interview and just a great human being. So I would say that any of those three, you can't lose. Sounds extremely, extremely cool. You got a, you got a free ticket into, into three. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so so the, the next question is about the book. So you mentioned the book. It could be that book. It could be another book. What book would you say is something that you recommend for people that are listening to this pod podcast to read? It doesn't have to be directly related to gamification. It could be, but it's entirely up to you. I think those three are, are great. Um, if I had to pick the single best book I've read in education in the past 10 years... Um, is is George Caros's book, The Innovator's Mindset. Um, I, it's it is not about gamification. It's just about like the way we think about school, um, and it is a step by step process of like why the old way cannot work, and what we as educators owe it to um, the next generation of learners to do. It's 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 awesome. I, I can't say enough good things. So, Innovator's Mindset by George Caros. <laughs> Phenomenal. It sounds like a very exciting book. It's going to be definitely going to my list. Yeah, it's worth it. And like, we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards. I would love to like, pick your brain and see what you think. <laughs> sure. So, the, the final uh, like formal question that we ask in this podcast is, is slightly gamified, as we like to, to say. Uh, this is a question I don't know which question will come up, but I do know it does make sense for the podcast. I checked it before before getting into this interview. So I'm just going to click over here and we're going to get a question. Okay. Um, 
Okay, sounds as well that it makes sense. I've been very lucky lately. Um, <laughs> and they make a lot of sense for, for the guests. Um, how would you promote the widespread adoption of gamification in a school? And I'm sure as a coach in a school, there's many things that you can add in that direction. Yeah, um, whew, I think it's no secret in the 21st century that isolation is the great enemy of teacher improvement. Um, we need to be elevating and celebrating this profession and, and putting people on blast who are doing great things and letting them know that what they're doing matters and encouraging an open door culture um, where people can see it in action. Because there's a lot of people who, I mean, understandably, like there's a lot of snake oil salesmen in the business and there's a lot of people who do cheap gamification and it looks like it's just fun and games. Um, but, but, when, <laughs> yeah, right. um, but when you see it and you get to feel it like in action, like, and that could be through instructional rounds, it could be through the hashtag observe me, it could be through ed camp, it could be through PLNs. Like, you need to put your eyes in somebody else's classroom. Uh, you need to get on Twitter and like be seeing this type of thing that people are doing. Um, because look, it's natural to be a skeptic, I get it. Like there's, there's, these are your kids' education. We can't afford to fool around. Um, and, and the idea of if it is time wasting, I think people don't take it seriously. I think the biggest the biggest way to dismantle that is open the doors and let somebody come see it. Like, hey guys, I'm pulling off an escape room today. I want you to come see it. I I don't think this year I because of my nature, my job, I, I I deal with admin all the time. I don't think I had a formal observation this year, but I probably had 60 people in my classroom. Um, it's like come see it, you know, come see it. And I would love I would love to welcome you on any given day. Like that is the great mover in in, in changing people's hearts and minds. Wow, so leading by example, so to speak. That's a yeah. fantastic advice. Fantastic advice. So, well, John, our time is almost up today. Uh, is there any final piece of advice you would like to leave our listeners with? And I always, I always mention this, and I, I, it might be tiresome, but especially for those that you know might be on the edges, that might be you know thinking about doing it, thinking about not, what's the good, what's the bad. What would you recommend, especially somebody who has never gamified his classroom? Everybody who's on your show says start small and don't do points, badges, and leaderboards. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that I would echo that. Um, but I would say for a much, much uh, more bite-sized piece, if you have CBS, watch uh, an episode or a season of the TV show Survivor. Like, it is a master class in how a game can evolve and grow and keep players on their toes. And just when they think they have all the answers, the game changes the questions. Um, I mean, it's schlock bad reality TV, but it is so good at doing what it does. And look at just that as an example and say, well, hey, I could do like an obstacle course in my class. Not like the kids are racing through mud and, you know, climbing up trees. But, <laughs> well, maybe they, okay, well, once they completed their quiz, then they could like, and the way that it has the social gameplay and these sort of meaningful choices, like, you know, a player will win and they've been starving on an island for 30 days. And it's like, okay, you get to pick one other person to go with you on a reward. It's like, oh man, there's all this social dynamic about how to, to make these choices and that's cool um so you know it's summertime it's a great chance to kick back and like binge watch some tv watch survivor um jeff probst is a master educator and he doesn't even realize it and that that's that's an easy way to get into gamification fantastic then that's very very practical so thank you for a beautiful example that you gave um let's close this up with how can we connect with you and then we'll say it's game over Game over. Um, so it's my last name on Twitter. It's Amazon Mary, E-E-H-A-N. Uh, that's either Mian or Meehan. Um, and then it's E-D-U, like teaching. So Meehan, E-D-U, um, on Twitter. Um, I'm, I love this stuff. I live for it. I tell the kids I have no life and no friends. I just geek out about teaching all the time. So uh, <laughs> I'm talking about it. I mean, I would love it. Um, and I, I welcome conversation, uh, tweet ups anytime. Um, since your site is a slightly difficult to, to spell out, I'm going to spell it out because I'm reading it right now. It's sites.google.com slash bishoponnell.org slash dream rush. Yep, that's me. And there you'll find many exciting things about his direct classroom. It's not just a site where he talks about it. It's also a place where he uses for his, for his classroom. Is that right? That's exactly it. And I think <laughs> I linked to the blog and all the cool stuff the kids are doing. Like there's embedded, you know, I, it, it's, it's like the one-stop shop, man. Fantastic. So thank you very much, John. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your, all your examples or your, all the things that you gave to the engagers to, to implement, to think about. And it's now time to say it's game over. Rob, I appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thanks to you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast Engagers. If you want more interviews with incredible guests like John, then go to professorgame.com slash subscribe and get started to our email list. 
You can even suggest featured guests by replying to the email that you get once you're subscribed. Hey, and before you go on to your next mission, would you like to know how scorecards and keeping scores is fundamental for gamification? Then you have to listen to Toby in the next episode of Professor Game. I'll see you there.